I know that the bulletin has a passage in Samuel. And all I can say to you is, we're going to get there. But we need to have the backstory first. So if you have your Bible with you, I'd invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 36. Genesis chapter 36. And we're going to look here at a couple of verses beginning at verse 9. Genesis chapter 36, verse 9, and a little more. This is the account of Esau. Anybody remember him? Brother of Jacob? Okay, so we're back at that spot again. Okay, so this is the account of Esau, the father of the Edomites. Oh, well, that's going to be important as we go forward because this nation of Edom is going to be at cross purposes with the nation of Israel within a very few chapters. So it's important that anytime you see Edom, you remember this is Esau's kids. Okay? So the account of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Adah, and Reuel, the son of Esau's wife, Basamat. The sons of Eliphaz, Taman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Esau's son, Eliphaz, also had a concubine named Timnah, who bore him Amalek. I wanted to introduce you because today's story is going to involve the Amalekites. Uh, I know we always say Amalekites because we're English and we put the first accent on the first syllable all the time, but in Hebrew it's always the second unless the word is really long and then sometimes it'll shift to the third. So while we would say Amalekites, they would say Amalekites, but not that it matters. Just so that you can beat your friends at, you know, trivial pursuit. So here we have Amalek is one of the Edomite tribes, one of Esau's children. Okay, so this is where we get our introduction to Amalek and his offspring, his family, who will become the Amalekites. If you'll turn back with me to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. As we look at Exodus chapter 17, we're going to pick up at verse 8. So Exodus chapter 17 and verse 8. Still hearing pages turn, so good. Okay. The Amalekites, ah, okay, so these are Esau's kids several generations later because now we're in Exodus, so we're talking about the people of Israel leaving Egypt and moving towards the promised land, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Oops. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So we all know the story, but probably most of us had forgotten the enemy. Okay, so this whole story where Moses is holding his hands up and as long as they're up, he wins, and as long as he, they're down, he loses. And so Aaron and Hur hold his arms up. What we forgot was that was the Amalekites that were doing this. Um, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. 
So you got the people of Israel are trying to get to their promised land and their cousins attack them from the rear and slaughter many. And God says, I saw that. I'm not going to do anything about it now. But there will come a day where I will blot their memory out. To put that in a language that we can understand nowadays, the only way you get rid of a memory of a people is to make sure that there are no more people. You completely kill everyone in that group. Wow. Okay? So God says, there's going to come a day when I will blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner, uh, Jehovah Nisi, or Yahweh Nisi, if you like. And he said, for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So the Amalekites don't know it, but they just declared war on God. And God declared war back. Okay, so then let's jump forward to Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24 and verse 20. At this point, while you turn there, we've got the whole story of Balaam and Balak. Balak is the king who tries to get Balaam to curse the Israelites. And the Israelites, three times, he tries to get him to curse the Israelites, and all three times he blesses them. Okay, God totally foils Balak's plan. But when we pick up here in chapter 24 of Numbers and verse 20, Balaam is in the midst of one of these blessings over the nation of Israel, and he happens to be on a mountainside, and he looks over at the territory of the Amalekites. And he says this, Then Balaam saw Amalek and uttered his oracle. Amalek was first among the nations, but he will come to ruin at last. So here's an outsider under the influence of God giving the same prophecy of they're coming to ruin. Their days are numbered. That then leads us to Deuteronomy chapter 25. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, we will pick up in verse 17. Again, as you turn to Deuteronomy 25, 17, let me remind you that the book of Deuteronomy literally means the second telling. All of the first generation of the Israelites that came out of Egypt are dead, and the second generation that's going to be able to take the promised land is now in charge. And so Moses is going back over the law again so that the second generation knows everything that the first generation knew. So it's the second telling. So here in chapter 25 and verse 17, Moses says to the people of Israel, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land He is giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. Okay. So here Moses is saying, there's going to come a day when the Amalekites are going to be erased from the planet. God has said so, and when God says, you guys are going to be the instrument that does it. Now, God has given a lot of these kinds of curses upon nations, and sometimes He's used Israel to crush that nation. Sometimes He uses other nations to crush that nation. But His prophecies always come true about these people groups. Which leads us then to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now that you have the backstory, we're about to get a green light. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Samuel comes to Saul. 
Remember that they are not anywhere near each other. They're in completely different cities as Saul leads the people politically and Samuel continues to be a prophet and spiritual leader. And Samuel said to Saul, and remember that Samuel was old when Saul was young. Now again, I want to bring you back to the idea of all of these stories that we're getting to in these five or six chapters here in the midst of 1 Samuel are not in chronological order. The author is trying to explain why it is that the sons of Saul don't reign over Israel, but a different family does. The last two weeks we looked at how faithless Saul was. The, the stories of chapter 13 and 14 were the stories about how he just didn't depend on God. He didn't follow God. He didn't obey. He didn't do. He didn't. He just ignored God. And so this story is another story that's going to bring out another aspect of why Saul's lineage is no longer king. We learned in chapter 14 that. Saul's sons would not inherit the throne. Somebody else would. So Saul was a one and done. He was going to be the only Benjamite to ever serve as king of Israel. It was going to be another family that was going to be over the throne of Israel. And so in this moment, we're being told a story. Again, we don't know when. We learned back at the beginning of chapter 13 that he was that Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned for 42 years. Where are we in that 42 years? Nobody has a clue. Okay, but somewhere in that 42 years, chapter 15 happens. Samuel said to Saul, um, remember, <laughs> I'm the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So just just as a, you know, let's let's check the resume real quick. If I say something to you, you need to listen. I was the judge before you were the king. I was the prophet. I am the prophet. And by the way, you're king because I'm the one that anointed you king under God's direction. So I've got another message for you, and I know you're all high and mighty and you're the king and all now, and you've sequestered me off to the side and people rejected me and now you're the king and I get all that, but buddy, I'm better than E.F. Hutton. When I speak, you best be listening. Okay? So I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel, so listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. If you've ever heard the word harem, it comes from an Arabic word har, ha, it's tough to say it differently. H-A-R-E-M is where you keep all of your wives so nobody else can get to them. H-E-R-E-M, harem rather than harem, is a ban, a curse. This thing is completely devoted to the Lord and will be completely destroyed for His glory. That's the wording. God just pronounced a harem against it. He put the curse, the ban on them. They are to be completely and totally killed as a sacrifice to Him. Men, women, children, beasts, everything. Don't take anything from them. Everything belongs to the Lord. So, verse 4, Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, who by the way are next door neighbors, so you've got the Amalekites and the Kenites are like 
right on each other. It's like the difference between Bentonville and Rogers. You tell me where the difference is, right? <sighs> so he says to the Kenites, go away. Um, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. It's like, I'm about to beat your brother. You might want to go to another room. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so they're out of here. They step off to the side. They don't throw in their lot with the Amalekites. Verse 7, Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. A anybody see a problem here? I want you to go attack the Amalekites. Okay. I want you to kill all of them. Okay. I want you to get all of their animals. Okay. Nothing lives. Okay. Let's go. And we get there. And ooh, I could take his king prisoner. And oh, those are some good looking sheep. And, and. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Because, you know, Samuel's not hanging out. He's an old man. He went home. He delivers the message. He goes to his house. <laughs> his job's done. So he has no idea what's going on on the battlefield, but God does. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord, all that night. Why? Because Samuel is concerned for the nation of Israel because that army just absolutely failed to follow the direction. There have been thousands of people swallowed by the ground for less than that. There have been plagues that have killed tens of thousands for less than that. So Samuel recognizes how far off track Saul has gotten. If God comes to Samuel and says, oh, by the way, I am grieved that I ever put this man in charge. Oh! Samuel gets it and he instantly begins to pray and to cry out to God all that night. Sun up. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. Are you kidding me? God makes you king, gives you an army, gives you victory, lets you take out these folks, and you build a monument to yourself? Every other leader that won a victory stood up a monument for God's glory. It was God that got us here. It was God that won the battle. It was God that took care of our nation. Saul's taking credit. Mayday! Mayday! I mean, this dude is just crashing and burning. <sighs> when Samuel reached him, Saul said, Ah, the Lord bless you! I have carried out the Lord's instruction. Just in case God's lightning bolt misses. Get a little further over. Really? Samuel has been up all night praying over this idiot. Samuel has been up all night grieving with God over this idiot. He finally finds him after playing hide-and-seek because he was building a monument to his own glory. 
And this guy has the gall and audacity to go, mission complete. Everything you needed done is done. Samuel said, what then is this sheep bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Uh, you were told to kill everything and you've got the spoils of war. Exactly how is it that you followed what God told you to do? Tell me again how you've kept the instruction of the Lord. And Saul answered, well, the soldiers brought them back from the Amalekites and they spared the best of the sheep and cattle to, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Stop! Have you ever just wanted to look at somebody that was lying to you and just stop? It's exactly what the Bible says happens between Samuel and Saul. Saul is just flat lying through his teeth. Not only is it that, hey, I'm taking credit for everything that's going on. Oh, wait, there's some stuff going on. Well, it's the soldiers that did the bad thing. He, so he's trying to shuffle the blame off. And Samuel has had enough. I'm not sure exactly what the word in Hebrew is. I, I didn't look all of this up. But I am reminded of a family friend whose wife was negative. I'll put it that way. And at a dinner party one night, she decided to be negative. For like 25 minutes, she was running everybody and everything down and was just making everyone uncomfortable and was being uglier and uglier. And, and finally, her husband just very quietly looked over and said, are you done? And she got it. Saul, you're done. Stop. In, in, in our modern vernacular, shut up. This is what you're doing. This is what I want you to do. Stop. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Oh, tell me, Saul replied. Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? Dude, I remember when you didn't even want to be here. I remember when you were hiding in the luggage. What happened to that Saul? What happened to that Saul that was able to just say, you know what, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I am the smallest dude from the smallest tribe of the smallest group in Israel. How, how could I be king? Why would God pay any attention to me? Where'd that Saul go? You and I were both there, man. When did you get the big head? Reminder. The Lord anointed you king over Israel. You didn't do it yourself. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And He sent you on a mission. Let's review that mission. Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you've wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? And at this point, the four-year-old Saul shows up. But, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king. <laughs> he doesn't even get that the and violated what he was told to do. He is so self-centered. I did what God wanted me to do and I did it my way. Uh, wait. Wait. And brought back Agag their king. 
Verse 21, the soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. In his mind, this is a good answer. Look, we didn't bring them back for us. We brought them back for God. We're going to sacrifice all of them. Okay? What were you told to do? Well, does it matter? I mean, whether I kill them there or whether I kill them here, I'm still going to kill them. What's the problem? And Samuel replied, that is about the stupidest answer. Okay, he's going to say that in Hebrew, not in English, but that's basically what this next four verses is all about. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has rejected you as king. I don't know about in your Bible, but in my Bible, verses 22 and 23 are formatted differently. Because the Bible will sometimes do that to show a prophecy. Samuel isn't replying for himself. Samuel is prophesying over Saul. He is speaking directly the words of God. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. At this point, Saul is sorry. I know a lot of people that get caught and are sorry. There is a difference between being sorry and being repentant. Being sorry means, oh, I'm sorry I got caught. Next time I'll be smarter. Being repentant is being in that place where we say, yeah, I messed that up and I will do everything in my power to never do that twice. I will change. I will do something different. And Samuel recognizes that Saul still doesn't get it. He's playing the, oh, forgive me card. I mean, you are a Christian and if you don't forgive me, you're not really a follower of God, so I'll just play the you have to forgive me card because I got caught. And Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You're not the king anymore. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Stop playing the patsy. You're done. And Samuel turned to leave. Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Saul finally gets it. <sighs> oh wait, you're, you're like serious right now. Um, uh, okay, let me stop playing. And yeah, I get it. Verse 30, I have sinned. But please, honor me before the Israels of my, uh, elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. So Samuel sees that he actually went from, I'm sorry, to, no, I, I really am sorry. I repent. And Samuel goes, okay. I will not go back with you to acknowledge you as king because you're not. But if you're going to be a man of Israel who wants to worship the Lord, I'll go to church with you. If you're ready to go back and have a good praying through, I'm there, buddy. I will meet you at the altar. So yeah, I'll go back with you and we'll worship God together. And then Samuel said, 
By the way, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him thinking, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, and again, notice the formatting. This is in prophet formatting. As your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now it's interesting, I want to bring out one little dynamic point in this. Uh, Here in verse 35, it says that the Lord was grieved over Israel. And if you remember back in chapter 15, verse 11, God said, I am grieved that I made Saul king. And so you would say, okay, so God is changing his mind about this whole Saul thing. But it's important to recognize what Samuel says of God in the middle. In, so I can find it here. It's going to play hide and seek. Twenty nine. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. That change his mind word is the same word as grieved at the beginning and end. And what Samuel is trying to help Saul and us understand is that it's not like God was like, oh, well, that was a mistake. I didn't even see that one coming. No. And it's not like God said, well, I am just, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to go look for somebody else. Uh, no. God was grieved because this word can be the same for repentance as it is for compassion. You guys don't know it, but there was a grief this morning that was handled so beautifully, I may not be able to put words to it. Because I had a little young lady sitting back in this row run over to me during communion and tithes and say, Aries is here. And we did our song and he didn't get to sing. Can we do it again so he can be a part of it? That's the same word. So God is looking at the people of Israel and He's looking at all of the hopes and plans and preparations and saying, this is not what I wanted for my people. This is not who I cried. This is not the Saul I wanted. This Saul I wanted was the one that was hiding. The Saul that I wanted was the one that was faithful. The Saul that I wanted was the one that was obedient. But He would not. And so I've had to reject him. Guys, I want to park right here at this prophecy in verses 22 and 23 and unpack this for a second. Because as I was reading through this, what God just really hit me over the head with is this couple of verses is the absolute definition of disobedience. And I don't want to disobey God. So how do I avoid that? How do I get away from disobeying God? And it's right here in these verses. That God delights in our obedience more than anything we do. That He delights in our being completely in unity with Him more than any of the things that we're going to do. With God, it's more about being than it is about doing. Because when you are being who God intended you to be, you don't do the things that irritate Him. The being comes first. And to obey is the best thing you can do. It's better than all the sacrifices. To listen and do what God asks you to do is better than all of the sacrifices, all of the best things in life. For rebellion, oh, there's a different word. He just equated not obeying with 
rebelling. It's about not doing what God wants, but doing what I want. Disobedience looks like I did it my way. Instead, all Sal, you didn't realize Saul had the easiest job on the planet. I have been in a war zone where we had three different missions. You know, kill the bad guys, make friends with the good guys, and play with the kids, and feed them, and do it. And we're literally going from block to block to block in Iraq trying to do that. We're shooting bad guys, turning the corner, playing soccer with kids, turning the corner and handing out food and water to people that needed it. That's a tough assignment. You gotta have your head on a swivel. You gotta be paying attention all the time because you don't know that while you're playing with the kids, one of the bad guys might show up. Saul has it easy. If it breathes, kill it. That's an easy assignment. I can do that all day. There's no thought. There's no judgment. There's no emotion. God said, kill him. I just kill him. That's easy. All he's got to do is obey. But he says, no, I think there's a better way. But how does that rebellion come about? Well, Samuel kind of brought it out earlier once you were small in your own eyes, but the prophecy of God puts it in detail because verse 23 is in Hebrew parallelism. That is, things line up. So rebellion lines up with arrogance and sin lines up with evil and divination lines up with idolatry. God is saying the same thing twice with different words so that you get the point. And he's calling this disobedience rebellion and arrogance. Because what gives us that chutzpah to stand up in God and go, you know what, I think I could do this better. Arrogance. Our own pride. You know, he was told, go get all of the sheep and cattle and kill them. He's like, hey, I got a better idea. Why don't I take them up to the temple and sacrifice them? I'll, 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 I'm sure I can convince God this is a better idea. You arrogant, rebellious fool. Who are you to tell the creator of the universe how to run his kingdom? That, that's, that is the sermon title. See, the heart of disobedience isn't Saul's heart. Rebellion and arrogance is the heart of disobedience. And so if you don't want to disobey God, then humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and do what He asks you to do. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know, don't get on a high horse and start judging people that don't have the benefit of your superior intellect. How do I deal with the heathen, Lord? Love them. Yeah, but they're evil. Yeah, and that's mine to take care of, not yours. Your job is to give them the gospel, not the sword. You're not the judge. I am. You give them the opportunity to repent. And if they don't, then I'm the judge. And if they do, then I'm still the judge. Your job is to obey. And, and this reminds me of another story. And, and I will go ahead and warn you, I wore my boots today. Hope you did too. Because this next one puts it a little more succinctly. And this is a teaching of Jesus. If you'll join me in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 
Jesus is in the midst of this very long sermon where he's giving all kinds of parables and he shifts back and forth over several chapters to whether he's talking to his disciples, whether he's talking to the crowd, whether he's talking to the Pharisees. But at this point, at the beginning of Luke chapter 17 in verse 1, he's coming back to his disciples specifically. By the way, that would be us. Okay? So, here's Jesus' message. Same God, same situation. What does disobedience look like? What does, how should I then live? Jesus says to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. So his opening gambit here is, you need to be living a life that brings people closer to God, not farther from Him. Don't do what you think is right. Do what He said was right. Be, guard, be on guard for yourselves. Now, this is in exact opposition or completion, I guess you would say, to the whole log versus spec. You know, I can't pull the log out of your eye, or I can't pull the speck out of your eye until I get the log out of my eye. That's exactly what Jesus is teaching here. You watch you. You watch to make sure you're not misleading someone else by the way you live. And then... Let's talk about the other guy, at which point our flesh goes, <laughs> yeah, what's going to happen to him? Because I'm one of the good guys, and that putts, eh. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Yes! Oh, yes! Wait a minute. Rebuking does not mean judging. Rebuking means, hey, babe, two plus two is not four. Or is not five, it's four. Four is the right answer. Five is a wrong answer. That's a rebuke. What you did was wrong. That's a rebuke. But what's the point of the rebuke? So that you learn, so that you grow, so that you mature, so that you become more Christ-like. It's not, you're wrong and going to hell. <laughs> it's, oh, friend. Let me show you the way to righteousness. Because where you're headed right now is destruction. So if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Oh, that again? I am so tired of forgiving this guy. I don't want to forgive him. I want to kick him to the curb. I don't want to forgive him. I, I want to be mad at him. I want to hold a grudge. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. <sighs> the apostles are as upset with him right now as you are. Because our flesh wells up in us and we're like, I'm not forgiving that jerk again. And so the apostles say to the Lord, increase our faith. God, if you're going to ask us to do this, you've got to increase our faith. You've got to make us more righteous. You've got to make us more holy. You've got to make us something different than we are because what you're asking for is beyond our ability. And Jesus says, um, <clears throat> here comes a rebuke of your own. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to a mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, oh, well, now come along now and sit down and eat. Would he rather not say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? 
so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. You see, he says to them, you guard your own life and you try to help those come along into righteousness and if they fail, help them and forgive them. And the apostles say, that's too much. We can't do it. We need more righteousness. We need more faith. We need an infilling of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, shut up. Stop it. You don't need faith to obey a command. You just need to obey. I know full well how to lose weight. I have to stop sticking the fork in my mouth. I do not need more faith to put the fork down. I just need to put the fork down. I do not need more faith to reject having an extramarital affair. God said, don't do it. So I obey and I remain faithful to my wife. I need more faith because that woman's beautiful. No, you need to obey because you're an idiot. You don't give up prime rib for hamburger. Ah, this is your wife. This is your husband. This is your responsibility. This is your duty. This is what you were called to. There are parts of our Christian walk that do indeed require faith. Believing in a God we've never seen. That takes faith. Doing what He told us to do takes obedience. Why is it so hard for us to obey what God asked us to do? Because we're, what was it He said? Rebellious and arrogant. Every time you think you know how to run the planet better than God, Every time you think he should have healed somebody that he let die. Every time he doesn't answer a prayer the way you asked for it. You're in danger. Because while that idea in itself may not be a sin, it is putting you on a path where you will. When I start getting the attitude that I can say anything I want to about God, I'm going to answer Him for every word that I speak. That's not me because I'm a pastor. That's me because I'm a human. What I'm saying for me is true for you. When He says, love your neighbor, it's not a request. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Yes, sir. Because you're in the Lord's army. The commander has given directives. And those directives are pretty simple. Follow me. Tell other people. Love everybody. That's it. But God, that person's not lovable. Wait a minute. Who made you God? Follow me. Tell others. Love everybody. That's the command. Now we put these to-do lists on it. We try to, we try to put up this fence where you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't go with girls that do. Am I meeting these? Because if I love the Lord with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, I'm going to obey Him. I'm going to follow Him. I'm going to do everything I'm supposed to do. And if I love you like I love myself, I'm not going to steal your stuff, mistreat your family, do things to hurt you. 
You see, by simply doing what He's asked us to do, I'm not going to have time to do the don'ts. It's just about obedience. And it's not a hard obedience. It's not like He said, okay, I want you to jump up onto that ledge up there. There's not one of us in this room that can jump up onto that ledge up there. Not one of us. There's not a thing in here that is beyond any of us. Because that's not the kind of God that He is. If He says, do it, it's because you can. And all you have to do is obey. Oh Lord, increase my faith. No, you increase your obedience. The fact that you're even talking to me indicates that you already have all the faith you need. You have acknowledged me as God. Well, then if I'm God, live like it. You do what I told you and stop trying to tell me how to run things. Just do what I told you to do. I love this passage because it kicks me in the shins. Maybe it does you too. Disobedience doesn't make God angry. It makes Him grieve. Now God is a just God and your disobedience leads to death. But God is not pleased with the destruction of anyone. He will do it because it is just. Not because He's angry. He's grieved that He created you to be all that you could be. And you chose to be less. He grieves. You choose to be what He created you to be. Enter into My rest good and faithful servant. All we have to do is obey. Heavenly Father, this is a hard word because it crushes us to our very spirit to recognize how often we take Your grace and Your mercy and Your love and apply it to ourselves in such abundance that we think we can say anything and do anything because You'll forgive it. And while it is true that there's only one unforgivable sin, we have to keep in mind, Heavenly Father, how much grief we cause You by not doing what You've called us to do. Lord, You've made this a simple task. To love You. To love others. To share the Gospel. Lord, I pray that You would challenge every one of our attitudes and assumptions. That You would point out those areas of our lives where our arrogance and our rebellion is building a wall between us. And instead, Lord God, tear down those strongholds that Satan would build up in us. Taking every thought captive to Christ that we may truly be good and faithful servants. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Do you realize that that's all Jesus ever asked any of His disciples? Follow Me. Obedience isn't about trying to figure out what God is up to. Obedience is about staying behind Him and stepping where He steps. Let us go from this place following the leader. Amen.